So good evening, everyone. We are just waiting as people get brought into the room via Zoom. So uh, it's just going to be a few moments before we're ready to start as the technology, I don't know, turns the wheel. It's probably a water wheel somewhere, slowly bringing people into this machine. Um, my name is Polly McKenzie. I am the chief executive of a think tank called Demos, and I'm also very privileged to be a board member of uh, Big Tent, which is a, a, a cross-party kind of festival of politics and also a community of people, like-minded people, interested in a much more kind of grown-up, animated style of political discourse to solve problems and get things done. Um, this uh, is a very exciting session that we have for you tonight with two kind of immense uh, beasts of the political uh, stage. Uh, David Blunkett, former Home Secretary, um, and John Humphreys, who I think presented the Today programme since prehistoric times. Uh, it's hard to remember, but certainly I started listening to the Today programme every morning when I was about 15, and he's been a voice in my ear for, therefore, most of my life. So it's really exciting to be uh, talking to both David and John this evening. Um, the session is being recorded, and it will be available to view in the members section of the Big Tent website. Uh, in future. It'll be used for promotional materials. If you're concerned about that, do let us know. Um, thank you. Enormous thank you to our partners today, Finn, PR company and COVID-19 Check. You can find out about more about them. Um, how it will work is I'm going to start a discussion between David and John. Uh, then we will keep that pretty short and we will open up to questions. Some of you have already submitted questions. Uh, as you as you registered, I'll take some of them. But then further questions can be asked in the chat. You can see that down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and then I will invite you to uh, to speak, say your question. Um, if you really don't want to ask the question in person and you want me to, that's fine. Just just say that in the chat. Please do stay muted unless you have a question. Um, I'll remind you of your question. Um, and we expect this event to last an hour. You can um, continue informal discussions afterwards. We, we kind of leave the room open as if it is a, a festival with an after party. So people can continue the conversation even after our, our guests have, um, have gone. Um, uh, and if the internet packs up for me or for <laughs> any of our other speakers, we've got an alternate chair who will take over from the Big Tent team. So if I suddenly disappeared, that's what's happened. But you are in good hands, I promise. Um, if you would like to watch a replay of tonight's event or any of our other Big Tent digital sessions, there've been some fantastic ones uh, just in the last couple of weeks. Um, that is one of the exclusive benefits available to friends of the Big Tent um, and also student friends. So go to our website for details or follow the link in any of our emails. And we would, if you're not already a friend, we would absolutely love you to welcome you to the, the gang, the tent, I guess. Um, so I think we are still having slight difficulties with John. Is that right, Georgie? You nod. Great. So yeah, technology. Hmm. It's it's uh, very unreliable. So it's just going. We're going to start with David, and we will hope that the mystery of technology is uh, allows John to join us for a moment. Um. Uh, David, we were we were just talking a few moments ago about the way in which politics has changed. You and John both sort of said to me that actually you end up these days agreeing on a whole bunch of stuff. And yet our politics is a politics where everybody spends, it seems, their whole lives screaming and shouting at each other, kind of trench warfare politics driven by outrage. Do you think that you and John just represent a, a, a past generation? Politics has changed forever? Uh, or, should we be moving, or, or should we be going back to that kind of I, consensus? I, I think that's a kind way of putting it. It, it may be, if you were really generous, that we've come through an enormous amount of experience. It may be that we're just old codgers who needs to be put on the scrap heap and uh, the audience and many others can make a judgment on that. I think we have been through, I mean, John, as a reporter long before the Today programme was involved in some of the great hotspots of the world, including apartheid South Africa, um, I have the un undoubted uh, challenge of dealing with the 11th of September attack 19 years ago and much else, including the dilemmas and crises with the Labour Party in the 1980s. So we've been through a bit, and I think it does make a difference, not just to 
understanding the issues and the balance of risk which we're in at the moment but also you know you get a bit of a feeling that you've been here before in many ways not not covid 19 is a a unique experience but some of the issues some of the dilemmas some of the things we're challenged with are not new and uh, getting to grips with those over the last three four months has been as we've seen right across the world a, a, a major problem for those with some experience but in many cases limited experience david can you hear me oh thank goodness you're here oh, I, was, I was going to have to do john I saw an image appear on the screen of this young man looking fresh as a daisy and I thought I know that face yeah, and I know but, that one. But and, I've, got um, to, I've got to confess that I'm not as fit as John. John, John goes <laughs> running at six in the morning and challenged the health secretary to go with him. I think it was the health secretary. Yeah, it was and he didn't accept. No, and neither would I. I'll tell you, you'd run me into the ground. <laughs> used, used to do that. I was just describing how we've been through some experiences over the years, you and as a reporter in some of the hot spots of the world long before the Today yeah, yeah. program, one or two things that I've been involved in. And it does, it does actually affect the way you see things. I, I believe that anyway. Oh, I, I, I completely believe that. I think you mentioned apartheid South Africa. Yeah, I was there for that. I was there in the States for Watergate and I was in the White House when Nixon resigned and all that sort of thing. And yeah, it does, it, it, it gives you, but you know the single thing, and you may not believe this, the single thing in terms of British politics that most impressed me about you was that you were the first Secretary of State, you were Education Secretary at the time, and I was doing an interview about whatever it was. Um, I think it was something to do with Ray Honeyford, I'm not sure. But anyway, we were talking about immigration and all that kind of thing. And, uh, and you said in the interview, I think I got that wrong. And I thought, hang on, my ears, you know, there must be something going, right, that this is a cabinet member saying, I think I made a mistake. What? That doesn't happen. But you had in Tisa. And the reaction from the audience, honestly, it, it, it was extraordinary. But um, you need confidence to do that. You actually do need confidence to say, look, we, we never get everything right. The, I, I've lots of criticisms of the way this government have handled COVID-19, um, but actually, on many occasions I've defended them because taking difficult decisions and particularly taking risks, the easiest thing in the world is to pretend that there won't be consequences with one action rather than another when there will be deep consequences, whichever decision you take. And it's a balance of risk, don't you think so? Don't you, I, more than that, though, don't, don't you think that, and you'll notice I'm much better at asking questions than answering them. Well, it's much easier. That's why I asked you the question. <laughs> right. But don't you think when they do the briefings, and I think this is particularly true of Hancock, though not only him, but when they do the five o'clock briefings or press conferences, as they rather ludicrously call them, because they're not in any meaningful sense press conference in my view. But anyway, when they do those things, they sound as though they've been doing us all a bit of a favour and, and, and that they, it's inconceivable that they could have got anything actually wrong. And of course, in another few days, X, Y and Z will happen and then everything will... I mean, it's yeah. as if we were a bunch of children and they were, and they were, whoever is at the podium was, was the headmaster or headmistress of a primary school and saying, now children, you've done very well, but let me just remind you now about what you are meant to be doing. And then they run through all the rules and the advice and all that all over again. And then were they questioned about why the, an, an acceptable amount of testing hadn't been done, for instance, they don't say that's because we got it wrong at the time, which manifestly they did. And of course, as you rightly say, <laughs> they're not gods, they do get it wrong, they, maybe they listen to the wrong bit of, of, of scientific advice or whatever, but instead of that, they just repeat what they have already said. And, and I know you've heard this a million times and an awful lot of people will and they'll be fed up with me saying it, but it, I think it does erode trust in the end. Well, apart from anything else, it sometimes sends terribly mixed message. I think the communication has been shocking. The idea that you could meet one grandparent, but not two, uh, but you could go out and meet anybody else. You could, have your, you could have your nanny back and your cleaner, but you couldn't have your granny back. It's a bit hard. Um, and these, these messages then erode people saying, well, what do we be believe? You see that with the schools at the moment. Mm. Parents genuinely don't know what to believe. They're getting completely contrary advice rather than saying look we can't guarantee 
there is no risk. Of course we can't, and we shouldn't even pretend we can't. We're balancing the risk of children not getting educated, many of them actually at risk, because we know they are, uh, versus the possibility that they might catch it, or a teacher or teaching assistant might catch it. That, that's, we just need to be absolutely clear about it, and then say, that those of us who have been parents, those of us who have been teachers, and I am, uh, or have been an education secretary, all the past education secretaries who are alive as far as I'm aware are all in favour of getting children back. They may have real doubts about how it's been done and the build up to it and the advice and the support. But we, we you know, th listen to one set of advice versus another. Otherwise, we'd never have run into that terrible time when we had to get out of persuading people not to have vaccines for MM with the MMR scandal. Yeah, because yeah, one yeah. Is Wakefield persuaded a lot of people that he was an expert and they were putting their children at risk and we've somehow got to get over this fear. It, it, that's true and, and, what, and what about the the quarantine now foreigners or indeed British people arriving at British airports and having to go into quarantine I mean they can't they'll, they, they'll have to give way on that won't they? I'm sure they're working out at the moment firstly they haven't actually laid a regulation in front of parliament we are discussing democracy I think the balance of power has shifted for, for good reason in the early stages, massively to the executive, to, to government. Parliament's yep. trying to fulfil a role, but if you haven't actually had something placed before you, you can't actually even have the debate about it, even if it's a cobbled together debate. We've had the demolition of local government, which is so lacking in confidence that instead of local authorities, not just over the education issue, where they could have said, look, we, we'll take the initiative, we'll find ways of sharing best practice with our schools and with trusts, we, we'll do it. Uh, don't necessarily make it 1st of June because we've got different circumstances. I think people would have said, fine, we understand that. Instead of that, you've now got some local authorities, including my own, telling children not to go back to school, others saying it's absolutely fine, government saying please do, God knows why, you know, parents, no wonder they're, they're bewildered. And I'd, I'd like local authorities now, for instance, to be saying, let's not wait for the government to tell us about setting up summer schools, as has been suggested by the Children's Commission, or big time mentoring schemes. Let's start putting them together and challenge government to help support and fund them. That, in other words, collectively, as well as individually, Let's take how, a, you, how would you do that, David? How would it work? And did you say collectively? I mean, you have only one executive, and that's and, you know, uh, that's the government. Um, they 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 make the laws, the regulations, and all the rest of it, with the approval of Parliament, of course. So, how would you do it collectively? Well, on the example I've given, and it might have applied to test and trace in the very early stages, where you are not forbidden to do something. In the old days, when I was leader of a, a major city, we would just do it. We, we would say, yeah. we'll put it together. We'll use whatever resources, volunteers, support systems we can pull together, and we'll challenge government to make this an exemplar and then to back it. Uh, now, I understand why that's not happened, because, the, you know, the whole stuffing's been knocked out of local government, as well as the austerity measures affecting local government services more than any other public service. So I, I get the message as to why, but somehow we've got to restore that, because Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have at least got devolved administrations and can make decisions in, in those uh, nations themselves. Whereas in England, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting all the time for the, uh, the evening press conference. God yeah. forbid that we should ever continue having to put up with this for very much longer. Well, I'm, 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 I'm glad you agree with that. Do you think that, you well, may have said this earlier, really by the way, but I, I joined you slightly late, as you know, but do you think that, this will end up damaging democracy because there is a huge amount and growing, it seems to me, you may disagree, a, a, a growing scepticism about whether the government is really on top of things. Might it damage democracy, do you think? I hope not, because as I said earlier, and I think you agree with this, you've got people, some with little experience, some with some, actually taking the most enormous decisions and balancing risk and I would never have expected for instance a conservative government to turn completely on its head and accept Keynesian economics <laughs> but yeah. has done that and all credit uh, to him because you had to take an immediate and big decision didn't you 
you'll, you'll have seen this over the years. You, you reflect for a minute on some of the things you've seen, John, where people have had to take a, a totally different view of the world. Ted Heath nationalised Rolls Royce. Mm, quite. Exactly. Are Americans they not? Was a prime minister. He was a Conservative prime minister some time ago. <laughs> are, they, are they now going to have to take really big decisions? And if they do, would they have the support of, of, of the, the opposition? Or should they have the support? Of the when it comes to the sort of big spending plans that Johnson, Boris Johnson, um, had outlined, uh, and should they, for instance, well, it's one example. HS2 is one example, obviously, but there are lots of others. Should we cut defence spending? Should we um, tell old age pensioners that the triple lock is no longer a triple lock? It may be a double lock, but not a triple lock. And that would arouse a great deal of indignation. But should they now be contemplating? Are they now contemplating these really big decisions, given that we are so, so poor as a country now? Well, I'm sure they are. I'm, I'm sure you know, you're, you're, you're falling into the John Humphreys mode, so we're not having... <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> I'm doing it for quite a long time. I'm, I'm nearly as old as you, David. <laughs> well, well, let's put it this way. You and I agree, because you've written about it at length, um, that we shouldn't discriminate against people on age grounds. And I, yep. you know, I've campaigned on that as well, and I think we've probably won that one. Um, now that's as far as the lockdown is concerned. We should yeah. protect people specifically because of their age, either because there are a lot of quite well off, not rich, but quite well off people over the age of 65. And we need to try and balance that with the enormous catastrophe that's hitting young people. It was before the COVID, but mm -hmm. it's going to be dramatic now. And we yeah. will need a youth core a, a, a new deal for the young unemployed all over again won't we um to get this back so how, how you, you asked about the opposition i can't see how the opposition could oppose raising resources to invest because that's been the policy it was the one policy overall broad policy that i didn't have any disagreements with the previous leader of the labor party <laughs> yeah and god knows there were a few of those yeah but i mean really big things like defense spending and foreign spending spending on international aid those sorts of things now are all up for grabs aren't they but the, they're two very separate things one is can we get a sensible view of what a defense policy might look like when it's all about cyber rather than um, yep necessarily missiles and the second is how we build the submarines that how do we help the people who are going to be devastated much more than we are by covid19 and that involves mm. a international policy because the one thing that's been really bad about the last six months is that whilst we've got global trade and massive global tech companies and social media we've acted so poorly politically, haven't we, in terms of joining together. It's getting slightly better outside America, uh, but they've got their own problems. So I'm gonna, in, I'm gonna interrupt. Uh, I know that John and David could probably talk all evening, but just so that we can we, bring in- And the next day, and the next day. Yeah, great. Um, uh, but then you'd miss your run in the morning, John. We, you know, Question. We're going to go to questions. And yeah, we want John's to got to answer questions as well as ask them, okay? <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah, so, um, so the first question is from, from uh, Anne Reyersbach. And Anne, if you could direct your question very firmly to John to insist that he answers it. Don't, don't be so browbeaten. These questions are for David as well, but anyway, let's go right. ahead. Um, do you think, that, uh, John, that it's possible that um, a different government might have managed the COVID crisis rather better? That's the first question. And the second one is, um, do you think anything will have changed forever about the way we live once we come out of this, assuming we ever do? That that second one is is much easier than the first because the answer to the first is I simply don't know. I mean, it would depend who it was. Keir Starmer seems an entirely sensible and thoughtful 
uh, bloke, but then how do we know how we react to a crisis? And that's what test politicians. Do yeah. you remember the old Harry McMillan <coughs> line, you know, when he became prime minister, what are you afraid of? And he said, events, dear boy, yes. events. And that's what Welcome, them, isn't yeah. it? Um, as for whether the world has changed, do you know what? I, I slightly suspect it hasn't. And I was, <laughs> I was thinking about that this morning when I was going for my usual morning run, and indeed yesterday <laughs> morning, because the very sunny weekend and thousands of people in the park and all the rest of it. And I have been relishing the fact for the last couple of months that I was able to run around the park, hardly anybody there at six, six o'clock in the papa, six in the morning. Um, and the grass was clean. It's brown now, not green any longer, is it? But there was no rubbish there. People hadn't been picnicking. Or this this morning it was absolutely carpeted with 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 litter and i thought oh dear that didn't last very long did it and that's a very tiny tiny example but we sort of i think maybe deluding ourselves just a little bit if we believe that because we have behaved so impeccably i think most of us we will not uh, use the name of Dominic Cummings in this answer. Of course, of course, we wouldn't. I wouldn't dream of it. But most of us have behaved impeccably, and I suspect, I suspect that actually that'll kind of fade away, and we'll we'll become the rebellious lot we always were. I rather hope we do, actually. Yes. On the first question, I I think only experience. I don't think this was a matter of ideology, although it, the, no. the build up, obviously, the austerity decade and all of that made things very much more difficult so we ended up with a slogan that wasn't stay apart save lives we ended up with stay at home save the health service Quite. um which was uh, really an outcome of that on the second question i'm a pessimist i think i think there will be a residue for some time of mutuality and reciprocity of people who have developed incredible mutual organizations at local level and people have helped each other. I'd love, love to believe that that would continue. It might if we could find a way of mobilizing, of keeping people involved and engaged in a positive way. Whether companies will behave with corporate responsibility better. It, the, the problem is that human nature clicks back in and you know there's good and bad in human nature as we all know. And I've struggled in my political life to work out how do you reinforce the good in people and suppress the bad? And you can't do it by legislation. You can do a bit of it, anti-racist, uh, anti-sexist, uh, anti the kind of behavior that was tolerated in the past and wouldn't be tolerated now. You can do a bit of that, nudging and directing. But in the end, we've got to find a way of changing people's attitude towards each other and maybe maybe this is an opportunity to help but only to help mind you mind you can i do you mind if i just pop in on that one because isn't that perish the thought because you're not an arrogant man but but isn't that a wee bit arrogant a politician saying we have to change the way people think it could be that the people are right more often than the politicians or indeed more moral even. well the, the trick is the trick is knowing it um, and, that, and that's about listening and reflecting and being close to people not necessarily you, leadership means you've got to lead I mean there's no question about that yep. but you lead from understanding where people are and how they feel and that gets us into really big areas about migration and things of that sort where people's fears can be unpleasant and uncomfortable but legitimate and you have to deal with those in the best way you can. But you can't just follow. If we had, we, we, we would still have appalling laws against being gay. Um, yeah, true. So you have true. to move things on through leadership. But if you're not listening, you won't take people with you anyway, and you'll get a reaction. Mm, good one. Can I go next to Charlie Eastman uh, for the next question? Charlie? No? Okay, Charlie is vanished. So I will ask uh, his question for him. Um, I think this, perhaps David, you could answer first, but um, how should public health communications take into account resources for those with disabilities and, and more specifically those who are, have uh, seeing difficulties? Well, there are two bits to this. One is the health issue and, and how, if you know that, people and you should through primary care 
know who's most vulnerable in the in the health sense and that you target help to them in the present circumstances we ended up moving for a million people being in total lockdown to the last figure i saw last week which was reflected in the house of lords was two and a half million and it had come down to two million today who have been told they can go out well lots of them actually have used their own common sense and avoided people but they've gone out at times when they wouldn't clash into people they've tried to get some fresh air if they didn't have a garden they've done things what you can do is target and that's we've always done this by subtle rationing i mean we've always had more demand than we have supply and doctors my wife wouldn't forgive me for saying this but for 37 years she was a gp had to take really difficult decisions and you try and help those who need the help the most the other bit of all this has been volunteering people actually been prepared with retailers to deliver food to get parcels out to actually make sure that somebody's dog's been walked these might seem the latter might seem trivial but it certainly isn't um, and it makes a difference to people's lives and that's combining public health with the acute health system and i've always been really strongly in favor of the the public health the prevention the support systems that keep people active keep them alive keep them com contributing as long as possible John, I mean, you've spoken out about the the sort of excessive uh, proposals to kind of basically lock seventy year olds up for the rest of their lives. Um, oh, yeah. you, how do you make uh, what do you make of the government's approach to um, to shielding, protecting the vulnerable? Here? I'm, I'm I'm not terribly bad. I do have a proposal actually, and um, the name I'm struggling with the name a bit, but there is a bloke out there. Um, who knows a lot about this kind of stuff. He's very articulate, he's very experienced. It's David Blunkett, I think it might be the same. Oh, so what we do, what we do is we, we dragoon him, you see, we drag him back to Westminster. I know he's knocking on a bit now, he's, but he's only 87 and, you know, he, he looks good for his age. <laughs> <laughs> And we made David Black. How about it, David? There's the offer. Well, actually, I'm not empowered to make well, the offer. But... I, I'm, I'm prepared to come back the minute they unlock the House of Lords, because at the moment we have a lockout, uh, not a lock-in. Yeah, so of We're not actually allowed into the chamber to do the debating. We have to do no. it like we're doing tonight, which is excruciating. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It's not working, is it? No. No. So there we are. I think that was a yes, by the way, Polly. I'm not sure. He didn't deny, did he? He didn't say, uh, I, if elected, I will not serve, did he? So, you know. No, no. Uh, si quite, quite seriously, since I left government, and certainly since I left the Commons five years ago, I've not regretted. I've not thought, oh, my goodness, I wish I were back dealing with this. For uh, totally perverse, and you touched it, arrogant reasons, I have from time to time got so angry that I really wanted to be there trying to make decisions it's driven mm. margaret my wife completely bonkers but, but... <laughs> that, that that i can believe <laughs> next question polly <laughs> um, so we've got a question from uh, our founder george freeman I'm mute i'm unmuted uh, john david thank you for joining us um although the big tent has a very sort of youthful energy about it to um think big and imagine a new future um, for a new generation. I can't help but ask the two of you who've seen a few cycles, which political party in your, in the course of your careers has changed the most? Oh, that's a, that's a biggie, isn't it? I think, I think, um, if we're talking post-war, well, obviously we're talking post-war, although... David yeah, in the course of your careers. Quite so, in the, in, in the course of our careers. I think you probably have to say the Blair government um, so therefore, new Labour, uh, fundamental changes, really. On the other hand, when Cameron came in, we talked, no, no, look, David will, actually, no, I'm not going to second guess David, that wouldn't be fair. But the, it did seem to me that for a long time, under, uh, under Blair, the country was changing in all sorts of ways, quite significantly. Then, of course, Iraq came along and knocked everything into it. Cock that, and that was that was a total disaster in every sense of the word. I would I would have to say the Labour Party, um, and and obviously if we go back just a teeny weeny bit further to Attlee, then you know there is no contest. On the other hand, Margaret Thatcher sorted the trade unions in a way no other government could have done. 
Perhaps she was a little overzealous, but nonetheless, it did the trick at the time. But I think it would have to be the Labour Party. I leave aside what's happened since February and the enormity of the economic decisions that are now being taken, which you would never have expected. I, I think Margaret Thatcher, and for this reason, not because somehow we all became neoliberals and this garbage that's poured out no. by those who believe that if, the, if, if you don't believe the state shouldn't run everything, you're a neoliberal, because you do come across that now. Margaret Thatcher, because she picked up Frederick Hay This Sorry about this, this is me being a university tutor. Um, Frederick Hayek from 1944 had been a, one of the very few voices at, attacking the, the consensus, the post-war consensus of the, the importance of the state, of the welfare state itself, and the way in which we combined to both achieve outcomes and to combat the great ills of the world. And I think she picked up in an interesting way that the, the Labour Party were vulnerable on this because we'd gone into a kind of cosy world where we believed that the government were re responsible and were going to do everything for us and changed the perspective very strongly with what was called the New Enlightenment. And to some extent, we were affected even from 1970 to 2010, not, not in the way that the abusive, abusive term neoliberal, but by the way in which that had reflected in the change in the outlook of politics, something about aspiration and ambition, which should have been a Labour core set of values anyway, but some about the way in which there was a reflection of the way the world had changed outside, the globalisation, which we've still not come to terms with. Thank you. Yeah, so, so that was a bit heavy. Well, I, I confess to being surprised that you both chose Labour when we see what the Conservative government is now willing to do. But, um, ah, ah, my screen just went. Oops, oh, it's back again. Right, really? I can hear David. Yeah, yeah, I, I could not hear Polly. I hope Polly's still there, otherwise, we could just chat to each other, John. We could, we could. Would we be yeah. able to fill another 20 minutes, David? That's no. the thing. Another 20 hours, perhaps. Anyone right, else? Go on. Try again. Question. Yes, great. I've had a thumbs up. Right, so next question. Um, uh, Darren Stevens. Hello. Um, it's great. It's like being listening to Radio 4. So, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> how detrimental to the political system is the continual division between left and right? And do we need a more non-partisan approach for a more effective style of government? Oh, I'll just do the quick and easy one that before I even get invited. The answer to that is no. Um, the politics, democrat, democratic politics does not exist, does not survive if you do not offer people a choice. And the obvious choice is between left and right. Depends how you define the both, of course. And there's, <laughs> there, there is left as in Jeremy Corbyn and there's right as in, well, pick whoever you like, Margaret Thatcher maybe. But you've got to have that choice. You absolutely must have that choice. And because people disagree, sometimes violently disagree, I don't mean physically violently, obviously, but verbally, that's good. That's how some democracy thrives. That you might then say, well, people like you, that is me in my old job, um, exploit that. And instead of having reasoned discussion on the radio or whatever it happens to be, you have shouting matches and people like me trying to score points off politicians and so on. And I agree that can be and often is sterile. It doesn't achieve very much indeed. But you've got to have, sitting in the Houses of Parliament, you've got to have people in power on one side of it and people in opposition on the other side of it. And they will inevitably have different ideologies or maybe just different ways of doing things without sharply differing ideologies. And in some ways, um, put aside the few years of, of the Corbyn uh, regime, um, I don't mean regime as in government, I mean his him being leader of the party. Um, sometimes it goes uncomfortably in one direction so that it looks as if we're never going to come together again in any sensible way. But we do in the end. I mean, I, I've been around for quite a long time and occasionally you, one gets the sense that, oh, this is 
this is a sterile art, this is a pointless art, left versus right, come on, surely there's not. And the answer to that is there is not a right way of doing it, a correct way of doing it, a foolproof way of doing it, or a way that will satisfy everybody, because we're all different. And I, I, I don't want it to be all cosy and huggy and, you know, let's all agree. John, hang on, hang on, John, come on. You were the one who not five minutes ago was saying that Boris Johnson, kind of conservative prime minister, should appoint David Blunkett to run the schools. Oh, uh, yeah, quite so, because David's a maverick. That's the whole <laughs> point. That is, that is the whole point. David is a maverick. There should be partisan politics, except when you choose that there shouldn't be. That, that's you a great point. Excellent. Are you, are you going to put some sort of proposal forward, Polly? I mean, yeah, you know, this seems, yeah, we could found a whole political movement on it. Um. <laughs> God forbid. I tell you, the day I entered politics is the day I saw my, my head off myself with a handsaw. <laughs> David, yeah. what do you make of tribal politics? I, well, left and right, whichever way you, you cut it, is about vigorous debate about alternative ways of, of looking at the world, of, of running our society. And that, that is crucial to the lifeblood because it moves us, it doesn't, it's not just that we let off steam, it's not just that we have a chance of changing the government and even if it's only minuscule, we change direction, but actually it also helps us modernize, it challenges, it, having an oppos a, a vigorous opposition as well as a, a competent government is, is what our democracy has been built on. Now I believe in participative democracy as well, I don't think you can just do this uh, with the titans at the centre. I think we've got to invigorate politics so that people feel that the decisions being taken locally has something to do with them, that they can have some uh, say in it uh, when they wish to. So I think we, the, the invigorating is crucial. Where, where it goes wrong is when one or other loses touch completely with the broad consensus and then people throw you out and that's that's good for democracy oh. and sometimes the Labour Party's oh. taken longer to learn some of those lessons than the Conservatives which is why they've been in power for far more in the last century than Labour has. Yep, I agree with all that. So the next question is from Kamal Sultan. Kamal, are you with us? Ooh, there's a sort of sound, isn't I'm, there? I can hear a baby. Yes. yes. I think that might be my daughter. She's singing. Ah. Oh, well, let's hear your daughter then. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't think we want to inflict that on the world. I'm going to read out Kamal's question, uh, which is about disadvantaged children. Um, uh, children from disadvantaged backgrounds. How can we help them get back into learning and catch up on the studies they have missed as a result of the shut down just as a for instance my uh, my middle son went back to school today uh, so it, it, we live in a, a very deprived kind of neighborhood uh, you know it's kind of classic London where there's you know great wealth and great poverty side by side six out of 24 children went back today David what do you think what do we do well firstly we, we've got the challenge of persuading parents to get them back in um, and to do so with support Secondly, we need uh, a nationwide but locally delivered mentoring scheme. I think I was mentioning it earlier uh, with summer schools. People say you can't run the summer schools. People won't do it. We, we did it in 97. We got 50 summer schools up and running in three months uh, from the election and people joined in. It was a fantastic experience. And we, we now, given the massive resources we're applying to furloughing and everything else, a small delivery of real sums of money to make that happen would not only d deliver in terms of recovery for the children, but would be a long-term way of trying to narrow the gap, which the Sutton Trust, which is highly respected, has already discovered, even in these 10 weeks, that gap between the, the, the better off and the worst off, between high achievers and low achievers, that gap is already growing again. And that should worry all of us. Mm. Can I just make a single point about uh, what's happening, our attitude towards children? Uh, and that is our very, it seems to me, loose word of uh, use of the phrase mental issues. If a child is pretty fed up after a few weeks off school and getting bored and irritated and becoming, you know, badly behaved or whatever, that's not because he or she has mental issues. It's because they're children 
and that's how they behave. Indeed, so do we. We get bored and irritable and depressed occasionally and sad, but we use the phrase mental health incessantly now. I don't know about you, David, when, when I was a kid, it, it wasn't used at all unless somebody was patently ill, mentally ill, and then of course it was, and we use some pretty horrible words to describe it, admittedly, but nonetheless we didn't fling the idea around that, that any div deviation from the norm, define the norm for yourself, of course, but any deviation of the norm means that you are in some way mentally ill, or stressed beyond the... I mean, I do wish we wouldn't do that. Well, quite often, let me be careful what I say here, because I'm not going to fall into a northern voice of saying, ah, oh, lad, it was <laughs> my time, and we, you had to just put up with it. Um, because obviously you there was did. terrible things went on, including in schools, by the way, oh. uh, as well. But if you're saying that actually our job as as adults is to help youngsters to cope to to become resilient then of course the, the problem at the moment has been social isolation for some children because kids above all are social beings aren't they they, they just love being together and i think we just have to accept that they are going to touch each other and hug each other and we have to take that risk i'm afraid because that's how it's going to work uh, until we have a vaccine uh, or the, we've seen this this uh, virus run its course um, and whichever's the first, please God, let, let it be soon. And that, that will ease quite a lot of the tensions. I think part of the difficulty is that we already have problems in the summer holiday, by the way. When I was education secretary, we used to debate whether we should have four year terms, um, four term years, oh, yeah. um, where we broke down the holidays much more because children go backwards, they lose touch, they, often get um, in, in real difficulties over the summer. We, we've got this in spades now, which is why September isn't, isn't good enough. And by the way, when people say rather naively, well, they're not doing it in Scotland, are they? Well, actually Scotland pulled stumps on schooling uh, in early July and come back in August. Uh, and if, you know, I, I would expect commentators to know that, but they don't appear to. So what Nicholas Sturgeon says, it's completely irrelevant to what we do in England. I don't know, by the way, whether my screen has gone black, um, so I can't see. Not that it matters. Can I can still and I, I, can't, I couldn't see you anyway, John, so just <laughs> <go on. laughs> uh, We'll just carry on, I guess. Um, well, can we come to Raoul Pinnell for a question about the NHS, just so that we've covered all of the major public services? Raoul. Well, good, e good evening. We seem to worship at the altar of the NHS and willingly give it about 130 million pounds a year, employ 1.2 million people. Um, is the NHS going to end up after this pandemic in a more favourable light for the public or more questioning light? That's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, I, I assume you can hear and see me, by the way. Not that it matters whether you can see me, but you can hear me, can you? Yeah, we, we can see you. Can hear you. Can hear you. Uh -huh. I, I, you can, yeah. Um, I, I wonder whether we mightn't perhaps start taking a more realistic view of the NHS, which in my view, for what it's worth, is that we cannot expect it to do everything. There are things it cannot do and shouldn't be trying to do. There simply isn't enough money. It is just that simple. If we were prepared to double, triple the spending, we'd still find ways of spending more than there is in the budget. And I know it's the oldest cliche in the world, but any bureaucracy that is as big and cumbersome and clumsy and inefficient as the NHS is, has to be at some point dealt with. God alone knows how you do it. And every secretary of state who's tried to do it has fallen foul of it in, in, in one way or another. But we've got to do something about the NHS, surely to God. I think that um, the danger for the NHS is in about a year's time uh, because we, we've got an enormous backlog of very, very serious cases and they're dealing with that and finding that uh, it's too late to operate or it's too late to do chemo or, or uh, radiotherapy or that the, um, the whatever particular ailment it is, is has moved on to a point where it's crisis measures rather than what they call elective surgery. I think that's going to be a real danger. My, my solution would be to much more, more decentralization. I think we've got to give 
uh, much more authority, responsibility uh, and accountability to people locally so that they can combine health and primary care, health and community care with mental health services and health and social care. And it's at local level that you'll join those up. Now, not everybody in my party agrees with that because they think it might erode the national health service. I don't think it would. I, I think it would strengthen it. The days, uh, John will remember uh, hearing this in his early days, and Aaron Bevan saying that he wanted to hear the bad bedpans uh, rattle yeah. in wherever it was in South Wales. I think they've gone, uh, and you know we've we've clapped the NHS, and I'm I'm cl clapping at home obviously uh, for someone who's worked in the NHS for nearly four decades, but actually it's it's out there in the community where it really matters. Yep. Why don't these big changes ever happen? David, you've talked about school holidays and whether they should be reformed, the merging of health and social care. I mean, I haven't been in politics anywhere near as long as you guys, but you know, these things have been drumbeat policy ideas from sensible people for the last 20 years at least. And I'm sure that you can tell me that they have been for the last 40 or 50. So why doesn't it happen? There's been efforts. Um, yeah. Some of those on tonight will remember, or will at least certainly remember the name of Barbara Castle, who was quite a formidable woman who I was privileged to know. And she set up something called joint funding, which was that you'd get the money only if the local authority and the health service locally joined up together. And we used to grab that money with both hands. I was chair of social services for four years before I became leader of the council. And we were glad to have it because we joined up what we were doing with warden and home health services, with setting up residential care, including for dementia, uh, way before other, many other areas were doing it because we, we take advantage of this money and we, we were able to say, we'll do our bit if you do your bit. And everybody had to collaborate before the money was delivered. Now, I think we should just go back to that as quickly as we can as well as having policies on social care funding, which are all about how to sustain people in residential care rather than keep them out of residential care. Mm, but Polly is making a, a wider point than that, I think, uh, aren't you, Polly? You, and and I if, if so, I completely agree with you. It's always baffled me, continues to baffle me, that when you talk to a politician like David or any of the other many, many other thoughtful, intelligent uh, politicians out there who've had serious jobs in, in, and, and, and done a not bad job of it. But at some point, they will, you will say to them, why in God's name do we, for instance, do we need to spend billions of pounds on aircraft carriers when they don't even have a planes to fly on them and we've no use for them anyway and it's a complete waste of money and they will nod and say yes absolutely or why do we need to have a, a district hospital in every district when of course it'd be better if there was more specialization or whatever it happens to be the big the big the big ideas you mentioned i think Polly or maybe david did um four term years um, of course very sensible and there are endless examples of those big ideas out there that and i'm I know you're not allowed to use the expression these days, but common sense tells you that they should be introduced. And politicians, when you talk to them privately, will agree with you. But then you get them in front of the camera or in front of the Today programme microphone or whatever it happens to be, and you hear something very different from them. Because I think, and David will probably tell me this is nonsense, but I think it's because they're scared. Because although it might be a brilliant idea and it might in time work, it will meet with a massive amount of opposition, either ideological or whatever, and it will cost them votes in the end. And, and, and it is as reductive as that. Uh, and some politicians, I'm afraid, and David is not one of these, some politicians don't have the balls for it to push it through. And they want to get promoted again. I mean, it, it, that's a pretty cynical view of the whole thing, I know, but there you go. It's, it's back to risk. I mean, just very briefly, because we could go on about this all night, but I was the Shadow Health Secretary for two years in the 1990s. It was the worst job in politics I ever had uh, because you couldn't win. I was in favour of community and public health. The party was in favour of keeping every hospital open, even if they were falling down. Oh. Um, and exactly. the battle that was going on inside uh, was reflected in some measure by the fact that the let's let's be face it john the cameras know about icus and acute care 
they get hospitals, they, yep. they don't get home helps and yep. keep them yep. alive in their own homes. Yep, exactly right. Exactly right. Okay, we've got time, I think, for one more topic, everybody's favourite, which is the BBC. Roy told <laughs> to ask about the BBC. Roy, are you with us? Yeah. Evening, Oswatha. Uh, Buenos Aires from Spain. Um, it's in the context of uh, an enneagram. We all want perfection. Um, and then the opposite of that is anger, as we know. So I'm going to ask a bit about the media. You guys know so much about, uh, particularly John. So is it wise for the UK to compare itself with other countries now? And, it, and this goes to the BBC. Is the BBC worthy of ca comparison of media in other countries? Or can it never win as it's essentially funded, and I see this as a bit polemic, as essentially funded by government? Uh, well, of course, <laughs> you'd expect me to say this, wouldn't you, after 50 years with the corporation, 51 years with the BBC. Um, it isn't, strictly speaking, it isn't funded by the government. It is a tax, of course it is. Um, but it's a tax you do not have to pay if you don't want to have a telly. And of course, everybody wants to have a telly, and so they pay the tax. And they get, in my view, even though I have fallen out often with the BBC, particularly since I left the institution, um, they get a huge amount for that money, not just the telly, which I personally don't want very much, but they get wonderful radio, they get wonderful web, and so on and so on. We all know it. I could bang on about it for hours. Um, so it is, it is, it, it is, we liked as we, you see, I'm still saying we, even though I've uh, been away now for seven months or whatever it is, uh, we like to say it's owned by the listeners and viewers. And in the end, they make the big decisions. Well, I wish that were the case. If there's anything wrong with the BBC, it isn't, in my view, the structure, although God knows there are now massive problems. How are they going to withstand the competition from Netflix and all the rest of it? I simply do not know. Neither, frankly, do they. But it's always, I think this is true, pretty much always anyway, being hidebound by the sort of bureaucracy that has by and large done it no favours. There is, and you touched on this, there is an uneasy relationship. There always has been and always will be, so long as it survives in this form, uh, an uneasy relationship between the BBC and whichever government happens to be in power at the time. Because what the government can do, of course, is increase the licence fee and it can change dramatically the BBC's funding. Um, and also every 10 years, we have, or well, they have a new license and the terms of that license will in the end be determined by whatever government happens to be in power. So the, the, the BBC, BBC policies are terrified, frankly, of upsetting the politicians. They will have rows with them, of course, but when it comes to the big, big fundamental question of the relationship between government and the BBC, um, it's difficult. Um, and that's that's putting it mildly. I don't know how you get out of that. Um, you, you could set up some sort of body um, that is entirely independent of government, but then hmm, do those bodies really exist in reality? It's a nice idea in theory, but would it actually work in practice? Uh, and I don't know what you do about that. But yeah, there is a, you do touch on a, on a hugely important issue. The relationship between the government and the BBC is, is, is massively important. I still think, notwithstanding everything, if, the, if we were to lose the BBC in pretty much its present form, of course there have to be changes, but we do need BBC news. We really do need BBC news. And of course, it has to be impartial. And uh, we, we might perhaps consider suggesting to um, uh, many of our presenters and correspondents that the use of Twitter might perhaps be just a little bit more restrained, for instance, and that opinions might be of jolly huge interest to themselves, but possibly not to other people if they're anyway. Enough of that. It'll only get me into trouble again with the BBC. Ra Raoul, you, you, you ask about the present moment, about comparators in terms of... Uh, the spread of the virus and what have you. I think on individual things, the BBC can collectively, because the, this happens with the press and media generally, John will remember, pe people do act as a pack very often, and it's very hard to be an outlier from the pack. So you do pick up a, a theme and you do interview the same so-called experts. Some of them really are experts. Um, we often need more voices from more parts of the country because I 
just tell you this now. I, I nearly threw my radio out the window once or twice because I was so sick of hearing voices only from London universities uh, and occasionally Oxford. And there's lots of people with real skill and advice and knowledge out here that needed to be used. But that's, that's a perennial problem of London-centric broadcasting. I think the problem's been that um, the, the BBC has done a really good job in this, in this last three months, really good job, and has been respected by the nation for doing it. I think the problem is that they've been too cautious. It, it's easier to interview people who themselves are cautious, who are voices of, if you like, um, over-emphasizing danger to the point where we are now, all the, all the polling across the world shows this, we are now the most fearful nation about COVID-19 in the world. Uh, that worries me enormously. And I'd like not just LBC and talk radio, but I'd like the BBC to start getting a bit more upbeat and to stop looking for misery and look for a bit of joy. Mm, I agree with that. Well, there is one piece of joy that let me tell you about, which is an exercise routine called 10 Today for Older Inactive People that was invented by Demos and is broadcast on Five Live Extra. So that is one thing the BBC is doing. They've replaced live sports coverage with an awesome exercise video <laughs> printed by a 73-year-old called Terry. So, Are you going to give us an illustration of how it works, Polly? Come on, the camera's on you. At least I think there's, it there's is. There's one I can't called rainbow. It's like this. Um, my, oh. I've got my mum doing it. It's the first time she's done an exercise routine in uh, at least. <laughs> um, I wish I'm I could afraid... see you. Sorry? I wish I could see you. My screen is blank, unfortunately. But uh, I'll send you are. a photo by email. Um, I'm afraid because uh, John and David have other commitments, we do need to wrap up on time. Uh, thank you so much to all of the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them but there's been a good discussion on the chat and uh, we will, as I said at the beginning, leave the room open so you can chat amongst yourselves um, uh, and, and have a discussion about, about what we've heard or, or wherever, the, wherever the world takes you. Um, reminder that you can listen again, watch again this video if you are a friend of the Big Tent and there are lots more really exciting events coming up um, uh, through the Big Tent digital program, so do, if you're not a friend, either sign up or just sign up to our email so you can know about the events coming up. Um, and thank you so much to David and John. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, speaking to you this evening. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. John, go well. And you, David, and you. All the best. Yeah.